Hi guys, so thanks for uh, joining this session. So I think if you, since you're here, you're interested to know more about how do you work with engineers, especially rock type engineers. And for some of you, I think some are already uh, working with engineers or some are already, uh, or maybe previously you're an engineer, so you kind of know how, how is it like. And a little bit about myself, how I got into uh, product management. So I was, I was studied here in SMU, uh, information systems and finance, so a little uh, technical, but also a bit business. When I first joined uh, the workforce, I didn't expect myself actually to be a product manager, but I was interested to know about strategy, innovation, stuff, and then uh, I realized that when I joined the, this graduate program at Singhal, I was rotated into different uh, teams, and one of my coach said, hmm, maybe you should try product management, and that was my, my last role, I said, as a, at the mobile finance team doing product development. And then, an opportunity from Ninja Band came. I, I, I thought, I never think about joining a startup that early, but they, uh, I thought, why not? And especially Ninja Band is actually, uh, not many people know that Ninja Band is actually a technology company, and, and, and that's what I wanted to be. And outside of that, I also, Try to learn a bit of Chinese, even though I look Chinese, <laughs> and yeah, some guitar. So, I think there are three takeaways I want to share in this session. So, uh, one is how do you actually identify the rock star engineers, and another one is what are the frameworks or maybe engagement tactics that you can consider when you use to, to work with the rock star engineers, and third is. Like uh, some general tips that you can you can follow. Actually, you can hopefully uh, walk out of this room and then you can consider using these three things. So one is how do you show quick wins? How do you use this strategy called push and pull? And why is it important to invest in this thing called uh, social capital? And before we start, I would like you to take a step back and imagine this uh, thing. So, this is the world where I work. How come it's like, yeah. But anyway, this is the world where I, I work at. So basically, anyone of you uh, received uh, any parcels recently, like from Lazada or like uh, maybe or even Airfrof or like. So, there are a lot of uh, different experiences and different um, things. But do you know what's happening actually behind all this scene, behind this one small box? What are the things that people do, uh, and how do they uh, actually eventually reach your doorstep or even your maybe your collection points? So there are actually a lot of uh, coordination required, especially for in terms of e-commerce. So there are a lot of real-time coordination between uh, different personas, different people, different uh, stakeholders uh, using different platforms. Maybe they use mobile apps on the driver, uh, driver's apps, and they use uh, like web page on the, on the operator side to identify where your parcel is, where, where your, uh, which driver should take it, or which route, or how do you assign which, uh, which uh, vehicles, and, and there are a lot of system integrations with various partners. So it's actually very technical, because you, you don't just integrate with your e-commerce partners, but also even like your fleet partners, even your um, retail store partners where like you do collection points and so on. And unlike, you know, tran transporting humans, you know, parcels cannot actually speak. So when there's something wrong, they cannot t uh, tell or complain to you like, hey, I'm, I'm lost, I'm, I'm damaged, or your driver is doing something bad. So we need a very uh, stable and very scalable system that, that can uh, you know, identify the parcel technically, literally in a, every second where they are and who is handling it or if something goes wrong, who should be, maybe who should take the responsibility or, or if something goes missing, where, where's the, what's the last point and so on. And we are in Singapore and we are in Southeast Asia. It's, it's a logistics nightmare. You have, you know, volcanoes, you have islands in Indonesia, thousands of islands in Indonesia, Philippines and and there are a lot of uh, even different kind of uh, customer segments, different kind of uh, expectations. 
from different cultures. So you have to localize a lot of things. So a lot of companies want to, you know, like that deal with it because can end up actually in a catastrophe. So luckily, this is not where, where I work from. <laughs> so this is like uh, a warehouse for, for that collapse. And even in a, in a manual process, a lot of things can go wrong. So imagine when you try to automate a lot of these things, there are, there are a lot of you know, edge cases that you have to consider. There are a lot of uh, uh, failure points that, that might happen. And big companies actually try to automate a lot of things, but even some big names have actually failed. Like in this project, DHL lost almost uh, seven hundred million dollars, and they just write it off because they realized that hey, it's just too complicated to automate. And yet, and in Japan, we we basically uh, use technology to differentiate ourselves. Basically, we, we we started in Singapore about in about mid two thousand fourteen. And we focus on the last mile portion of, uh, of e-commerce. And we are now in six countries, 40 cities, and, and serving almost uh, 130 million people. And this is all by leveraging on technology. And we built all this on the microservice platform, where, which is, requires a little bit more of a, you know, well-rounded engineers because they need to know how to handle its, its service by itself. And we also use algorithms to optimize your heart, things like the vehicle routing, capacity planning, scheduling, and so on. And yet, we only have 36 engineers uh, across uh, 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 nine nationalities. So it's a very lean team, actually. Oh, and it's uh, as compared, for example, to companies like you know the transport companies like Uber, they, they have like 2,000 engineers just to build one app. And we have only 36 currently. So we r really have to rely on, uh, on people like engineers. And as a product manager, this is where you, you really are, your inter intersection of business, UX, technology. This is especially true for the SaaS companies. But for at Ninja Fan, it's a little bit different. So we are also, there are a lot of human elements in it. There are a lot of uh, logistics and operations in it. So we are, we are technically in the middle of Logistics, strategy, customer experience, and even of course technology. And as a product manager, I think your your biggest value is, of course, is to to champion the customer, to champion the user, to find out what is the biggest problem, what is the most pr important problem to be solved, and and of course, as an engineer, actually, that's also something that they can do, right? <laughs> Technically, it's it's just I mean. I'm, I'm shooting myself in the foot here, but it's technically all just common sense. But it's actually also, as a product manager, we are. But as a product manager, we are. Um, we have the opportunity to to talk more to the users, to do more research, and so on. That's how we bring value. But when you work with engineers, also, um, the the tricky thing is that you don't actually manage them. You are. You're working in a cross-functional team. They might, might be reporting to the engineering managers. They might be reporting to the VP of engineering. So you have to, what they call, influence without uh, authority. And so how do you do it? And first, let me uh, suggest that not every tech engineer is actually the same. They have the, of course, they have the basic things like in terms of their personality, the culture, the experience, their interests, their habits. But in this section, I will want to focus more on things that is called the rockstar engineers, who are 10x intellectual capacity, intellectual, you know, you know, 10x productivity, 10x motivation. So basically, these guys are those who are, you know, you give one ticket and then you, you're expecting them to expecting normal people to complete within like one week, but this guy just completed in like one day, and then like you say, what's more? <laughs> and so good product managers, right? Usually start with why. And this is a lot of, uh, this has been emphasized a lot in, in different articles, like why, as a PM, you should focus on the why and not the how. But in today's session, I will want to uh, highlight that great product managers start with who. Because you cannot actually uh, lead your people, you cannot influence people unless you actually know who you are leading, what are their characteristics. So how? 
So you can use this two by two matrix actually. Like actually when you talk to engineers, you can classify them into these four quadrants. First is in terms of their competence. The other one is in terms of their, of their commitment, in terms of their work, how passionate they are. So I'd like to give uh, some example. Let's call this guy M. M is basically a very competent engineer in my company, but yet he is kind of doesn't have a, the most, uh, he is not the most committed person because maybe he thinks that he is uh, he's smart, but then maybe he's a bit bored with his, what, what he is doing. So he's just like, you know, nine to put the hours as nine to six, and that's all. And on the other side, you have people like I, K, or T, uh, anonymized. So people like them are people who are like very competent, but uh, also very passionate about what they do. Sometimes you give them a problem, and then they'll, they'll not just do the, that problem, they also think about other things. So, oh, what, what if instead of just building this button, you can actually send an email so that you can, you can tell the customer. So there's this, this kind of mindset. Or what if instead of uh, doing uh, this kind of a uh, uh, prediction algorithm, you can actually suggest based, uh, based on the location of the driver. So they're, they're very innovative and they are very, um, they take ownership of, of the, what they're doing. And also there are people who, who is like, see, he's very hardworking, but I mean, is is good, but maybe not as good as I K T. But because it's, it's it's definitely something who are who are available in your team. Because um, sometimes you don't always have the most exciting problems in your company that needs to be solved all the time. Things like customer support, like maybe maybe it's not so technical, but you need a hardworking person in your team because requests will always keep coming in, and and you know complaints come in, and and there are always things to be solved, but. Sometimes it just requires things like checking the logs, find out what's, what, what's wrong, and maybe just ensuring that, oh, maybe this service is not really uh, uh, functioning well, and then inform the other engineers, that's all. And of course, there are some other uh, people who are in the, in the fourth quadrant. So like, I give a crash exclamation mark. So it's not that they, are, they need to be fired, <laughs> sorry? Yeah, fired. <laughs> <laughs> nah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can, but yeah, you can hire them, <laughs> and and they are, but they are, oops. yeah, but they they still actually work for your com com company and bring value. So you might not want to fire them that easily, also because as later I will explain to to do you like these people can actually be moved around the different quadrants, and here is where the rockstar engineers are. High competence, high commitment. So how do you deal with them? So there are actually uh, four different leadership styles that you can actually use in the, when dealing uh, with, with people. And it can be further uh, differentiated by, by two factors. One is how directive you are and how supportive you are. Being directive means like you are being very you know, to the point. Uh, being supportive means like you give more feedback, or sometimes you, you give uh, you be more, more expressive, expressive to the to the, to the guy. So let's take an example of uh, asking someone to go for lunch. See your engineers to go for lunch. So being more directive, for example, like oh let's go to 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 this place. That's all. Like oh yeah, you'll, you'll just know it. But being a bit more you know, less directive means like, oh, you know, uh, I like I like this 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 place, and I haven't really tried it, and, and I'm a bit hungry now, and it's 12 p.m. <laughs> so can I can I uh, can we go there today for lunch and this kind of things? And being supportive is is giving a lot of uh, uh, support, being more engaged with him or her. Like, so uh, if you take again the example of uh, going to for lunch. So uh, you will you will give a lot of more feedback like oh you know I like you I know you you like this how was the food and oh you seem to be cooking the, the food quite well and, and stuff like that instead of just uh, saying oh good oh uh, good job or, or I don't like it that, that's it right so again there are four things directing coaching 
delegating the working. So directing means you're very direct, but you don't, don't necessarily give a lot of support. Uh, you, you just say that, oh, we, uh, you're, so you just say, oh, let's build this feature um, because uh, let's just build this uh, uh, tracking function on the, on the website. And, but then you don't really necessarily go into that engineers explaining, like checking in like every day, for example, like every few hours you ask him, oh, how's the progress? How's, have you faced any difficulties and so on? Whereas in coaching uh, style, it's you, 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 you tell them like, oh, this is what we need to build. Please do X, Y, Z. And, and if you are not sure, please go talk to that engineers. You, you, you basically give more direction and at the same time, you also check in like, oh, have you, at 3 p.m., if you call, call, come in like, oh, have you talked to this guy? Do you, do you face any issue? At, at 6 p.m., you realize that, oh, oh how, how's, the, how's the update on the, on, the, on, the, on the feature and so on. And supporting is where we, we are a bit lesser of a direction. So you just give up a problem. Now, uh, build this, but then it's up to you. Like, you can just figure out yourself who you need to talk, talk with. And, and so on, and yeah. Another question, yeah. Isn't there like a mistake in this? Like, should we delegate into Rockstar and uh, engineers and be yes. co coaching uh, low direct, like? Yeah, uh, yep, correct, you, you got the point actually. So actually, yes, for Rockstar engineers, it's a bit uh, 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 reversed. <laughs> so you need directing, delegating, coaching, and supporting. So. What I realized is that when you work with Rockstar engineers, you need more of a delegation instead of, for example, uh, because it's a bit counterintuitive in a way that for some people, because in delegation mode, you're actually a bit on the side of a low direction and low support. Basically, you just give the task and then you don't really give them feedback or, or don't really, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in Malay, called sayang or like sayang sayang, or you don't really uh, give them special attention because so some, okay. yeah. I, I'm not sure I understand the low support. The low support means you don't really you don't really have to keep engaging them. Okay. In in a way that you don't really need to. For example, if you have a high support, you have to keep accompanying that engineer, like like keep checking in and so on. Okay. Yes. Yes. So some people say that. Oh, actually, for Rockstar engineers, you need a low support, uh, more of a supporting uh, uh, um, strategy because you have maybe maybe the Rockstar engineers want more attention because they they are they, they think they're special and so on, right? <laughs> so, but I think what I realized is that using delegating strategy is actually more more uh, effective because sometimes. Uh, the rockstar engineers actually know that they are they're already rockstar, so they, they don't need you know the, the constant uh, praise and so on, and and also sometimes it can backfire because they know that they are already good, better than the rest of the engineers in the company. But then when you feed them their ego, right, then they'll they'll start you know thing. I'm very special. I, I need like uh, special, even more special attention. So like in a way, using delegating is 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 is, a, is better to 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 manage expectation. Yeah, any more delegating questions? Less attention, not more attention. Sorry? Delegating means less attention. Yes, you less. Attention. You just give them the task and then let them figure out. Yeah. So, just now, uh, Chaili used this uh, diagram to explain the build, measure, learn. <laughs> so, actually, I would like to also <laughs> use uh, this a concept called who measure learn. Because as I said earlier, people might change, especially in terms of the, the, the level of commitment they, they have to your company. And sometimes also in terms of their uh, uh, capability, because maybe they, they, they figure out about new ways of learning things, new ways of um, uh, investigating things, and so on. And so the trick here is that you don't just stick with just one framework, but you always have to think, uh, have this in mind, like, oh, you first know the who you are working with, and then you kind of measure uh, your, your, what you have been doing, like, oh, did, 
is that guy really a rock star or is that is that guy really uh, is, is using the um, delegating strategy really work with that guy because maybe there are some other things that 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 is the X factor you don't know because maybe they have uh, other um, uh, cultural differences or like experience that that is that is different maybe they they're more used to certain way of even though they are rock star maybe they are more used to certain kind of engagement strategy and so on so that's why you need to always use this uh, framework like who measure learn and not just for rock star engineers but this also apply to them is that there are also three engagement tactics that you can consider. One is, of course, to show quick wins. So, uh, for example, I think if you have, have anyone read this article, like uh, I think the 12 things that you need to do in your first 90 days as a product manager or something like that. Oh. <laughs> so basically, it's like there's this very good article, I think, by Ken Norton. Like, it's uh, one famous uh, uh, product manager in the, in the US. Basically, one who thinks that he asks for for someone who who, who just joined product or, or even as a as a team project manager who, who who just switched a role in a new uh, company or a new team. One thing that you need to do is actually to 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 maybe set up a one on one session as, as much as possible with everyone in your company, including your engineers. So for example when I, I joined in Japan, one one thing that I did is that uh, I actually talked to each one of the guys there to find out what what uh, what things they are doing, what are the problems that they are facing, what are how can I, in a, in a way, make their, their lives better? And it doesn't necessarily work like from day one. For example, like I realized that there's one this very smart guy in my company who who is a, he's, a, he's one of the rock stars in a way. He's, he's very he's very smart. He works like like technically from almost 24 hours. You just ping him at 2 a.m. and <laughs> he's still awake and he is he's, he's always suggesting things. He takes ownership and so on. And you know, very smart people sometimes they, they, they tend to judge you also like, oh, is this guy, is this PM, you know, like, is this really capable guy? Like, or is this like uh, just some random, who, who's this guy like trying to intervene me from, from the user, you know, like, and stuff like that. So by showing quick wins, also not just knowing them, but also to, to, to let them that, oh, hey, as a program manager, you bring value. You just, you don't just uh, give requirements, but you don't, you also, Challenge the stakeholders. You you ensure that everything fits into the company's uh, big picture overall strategy and so on. And from there, you can gain its trust or, or her trust. <coughs> and another thing is what I borrowed from my boss is actually uh, push and pull. So it's, it's a, a little bit more like a flying kite here. So sometimes when you fly a kite, has anyone flew a kite here before? Yeah, now if you, you fly a kite, fly a kite you, you can't just you know pull all the way. You you have to sometimes pull and then let go. You can you have pull, let go, and then that's how you actually make the kite fly higher and higher. So basically, it's the same thing with 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 uh, engineers. Or actually, even in, in 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 when you talk to like uh, people in general, because. Sometimes you need to set a really high ex expectation, make them feel a bit more stressed in a way. Like, hey, just give them, give them more challenge. Hey, this is this. I know you 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 can only do it in maybe a week, but let's try to do it in like five days because we need blah blah. So like, give them more challenge so that they're more motivated in a way. But then at the same time, once they're there, you, you can also gauge again from the who measure learn framework that oh maybe he's just now becoming a bit more of a too stressed and, and so on and so uh, then that's where you can come with the uh, like let go strategy or don't doesn't mean like you let go of the guy but like <laughs> but more like uh, you you give uh, maybe you give more attention like or maybe, like buy him food or you know like uh, becoming more of a friend tell tell a joke and stuff like that so play with the pressure a bit like oh high pressure then a bit lower high pressure a bit lower that's how that's how we, we, we can we can uh, optimize the, the performance. And the last thing is what I cannot emphasize uh, more is that uh, in social capital, like so, basically, at the end of the day, we are all, all working with humans, whether it's engineers or or, or, or product managers or like UI designers and so on. So, um, knowing your employees or, or knowing your colleagues 
beyond maybe just as colleague, but also as a friend, as a as, as a person, it's very important. Like uh, you know, maybe your their hobbies, maybe they they have some personal problems, maybe or their 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 interests, their their ambition, or their even and also helping people beyond their their KPI. Sometimes maybe things that is not in your job scope, like maybe. You need to. Uh, the engineer is so overwhelmed, and then you need uh, help with some uh, uh, tweaks in the in the in the email design. Then you can just help them do some HTML and so on. Yeah, sure. It's like a, a barter in a way. So like you know, build trust and then also build some uh, work good working relationship. And that's that's that also work with 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 the engineers because like what my CTO said that sometimes when when engineers work with product managers, uh, they like people who are who are technical, who who can understand at least what what they are they are saying. But so that you can influence them, so that you can you can connect with them. But sometimes, um, even without that uh, capability, they are still willing to work with you as long as you are you know they think that you are a, a good guy to work with. As as long as you, if they feel that you know they are not working with some some. Uh, Guy who, who thinks that he, he knows the user the best and so so, so on like so basically uh, by investing in this social capital it actually can help you to move things uh, in your company as well so yep that's it uh, for my session um, any more questions? Is there not much question? I actually have a major disagreement. Oh sure. <laughs> can we go back to the slide when we have like uh, different kinds of engineers? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'd say you measure capital actually lies not here. Your oops capital actually here. And uh, why so? So first of all, I think we leaving like a lot of variables out of the picture. That's why it might work in some companies, but it uh, actually like, greatly depends on the personality of a person from this area. Mm -hmm. And you put in like, all eggs in the same box, so you can be like, in great uh, danger if you rely on these people. Yeah. Uh, the great, uh, one of the big problems with these people is if uh, they're 10 times uh, more um, productive. Yeah. So if they go astray for half degree, yeah. because they're 10 times more constructive, they can go away, like, really far from what, you actually, what uh, your business is actually needed. Right. So by relying heavily on this guy and delegating to them, yeah. you're putting your business in a greater uh, danger. Right. So what I found in my experience uh -huh. is actually you want to rely on these guys and delegate to these guys. Right. So it can be risky, but uh, because they understand their position and they tend to doubt more right. and they're asking more questions. And uh, what it creates is they uh, tend to communicate more with uh, uh, guys with high competence. They're right. sitting uh, guidance on technology and therefore Result they providing here because of high commitment is as good as the result provided here. Right. But because there are a lot of communication, there are less chance that, that they go uh, like like sideways. Right. Because when you're talking a lot, you have to be aligned. Yeah. So one person can be misaligned. Five person it's unlikely. Right. And then again, because they are uh, doubting their competence, they asking you more questions. So they are getting better in business than guys. Who, oh. I already knew the task. Right. I'll just go and uh, build it. Right. So from my experience, you rely on these people, and you actually don't need like many people who understand their own high competence. You right. just need like one as a coach or two as a coach, but you need people like with highest commitment. Right. Yeah. So that, what do you say? Like that's like, that, that, that's a bulk of your force, not. That's a, a good, very good point actually. Uh, when I, I put this slide, it doesn't mean that I am mm -hmm. encouraging you to just focus on these people. It's mm -hmm. just that. This is where the rockstar engineers are, yeah. and as you rightly pointed out, you actually need some people here or some people there, not just all everything here, because you have dif different kind of uh, issues in your company. And um, oh, but my point was that you don't need many rockstar engineers yes. because uh, rockstar engineers tend to communicate less. They already understand the problem as they yes. see, and they can all go different directions at the yeah. ten yeah. times yeah. the yeah. speed of other engineers. Yeah. And that's where you, as a program manager, also you can you can always by by delegating. It doesn't mean that you you don't actually check at all mm -hmm. what what they are doing or where they are heading to, and and also it just that means that you are less directive, you are less prescriptive in what what you're saying, but at the same time because 
uh, also uh, you need as a product manager also what 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 needs to be assumed before before all this happens that everyone here in the company knows why we are building it in the first place. So sometimes, yeah, you you don't need to be. I mean, as long as for example you're building a a, a driver application and you are building uh, this feature on uh, on how do you want to notify the driver when there's a, a new delivery. You don't need, for example, with this Rockstar engineers, you just need to tell them that, hey, uh, I need to inform the driver whenever there is a parcel added to the, this route. Mm -hmm. And for these guys, maybe you, they will come with a solution where oh, I will set up my own SVM service instead and so on. Yeah. They will come with a solution, but because yeah. they're not drivers, they will come with a solution that's suitable for engineers. Yeah. And that uh, you can only delegate to this point if you can uh, replace all your dri drivers with your Rockstar engineers. Yeah. Otherwise, they will invent something suitable for engineers. For engineers. Drivers. Yeah. Right. And that's why, in in in, in again, I, I'm not talking about the, the development process here, mm -hmm. but but again, because we use like uh, Agile and, and Scrum, so when, when before even they can even deploy to the production mm -hmm. or before before they start. Uh, what what is also uh, useful is to actually discuss the requirements a bit a bit more upfront with him. But again, the way we discuss, as maybe we can we can let them uh, uh, come with a solution, but then not necessarily implementing it right away without your approval. Yeah. I may ask, do you uh, have your backlog client, for example, with all your engineers or with a high competence? Backlog refinement. Yes. When you have your backlog refinement meeting in your Scrum practice, yeah. do you ask all of your engineers to participate in, or maybe just uh, one of those in the Um So usually, how I do it is uh, I, I I start with the, the rough start first because usually so they do. You talk one one to one, or it's just a small. Team. It's a small team. Meeting. Yeah. So that because you will usually have to usually a better idea, but then after that you will involve the, the the rest also because sometimes when these people are engineers people. It's a bit too early, then they're uh, just you know sitting there doing nothing. <laughs> so uh, and then uh, it's, it doesn't mean that we are we are, we are and, and by the end of the day we are still uh, taking whatever their 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 uh, inputs are. And but yes, yeah, starting with the with the raw star first is, is I find it more effective. In my I can share like it's a funny story now. A management, it's uh, like. Uh, there are mismanagement. Right. Uh, so there are two, two guys in two different teams actually building like exactly the same thing. Oh. Like, yeah, it's happened. Uh, in one of the team, it was like definitely a rockstar engineer who like knows business very well, like uh, one of the first engineers in the company, like definitely a rockstar. He knows everything technology, he knows business, typical rockstar. Right. In another team, there was like a guy from a group, uh, a group C. Yeah. But like uh, really committed, but uh, his competence like way lower. He's like good engineer, but he just good, <coughs> just far away from Rockstar. So within the two week sprint, uh, guy who's a Rockstar, he's done with his with his solution. Yeah. Uh, guy who's like from Group C is like still working. Yeah. But uh, judging at this uh, time, we decided to discard solution built by a Rockstar engineer, and we just gave a guy from Group C a bit more time. Right. So, I mean, this uh, like I think really shows that like with the rock stars you cannot Can really de delegate. Yeah, but actually, when you use Scrum, uh, do you use Scrum as a as a practice sprint? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah because so. again, in, in that in that process, uh, I think that's where the daily standards are come into into play. Because mm -hmm. at least, yes, there might be some misalignment, at, but at least that's minimized by uh, a day's worth of work. Mm -hmm. By by aligning everyone, and then that's where your, your sprint planning also comes into play because mm -hmm. uh, you also use Jira and, and or like mm -hmm. some kind of tracking tools because at the end of the day we are still writing the requirements, we are still giving them mm -hmm. the, the task so that if if you use this kind of tracking tools, we can ensure that at least no one guy is is working uh, a duplicate work because when that ticket or is taken, it, it was different uh, teams, different uh, stand up, so we didn't know until it's. Finished to actually work in the same thing. Right, right. And both guys delivered. It just like by looking at their like technical implementation, we decided to go with a solution from a guy C. Right. Rockstar never knew it that we actually like abandoned his uh, solution, but 
that's what happened. Right, right. Yeah. So, yeah, again, I think the daily standard is where we can, we can put mm -hmm. whatever into play. Then as a product manager, you can also try to uh, use a little bit of uh, check-ins. Like, oh, at least you know what this guy is working on, this guy working on, and then you don't necessarily know that, or maybe he's building this feature by doing uh, this AngularJS, whatever, but at least you know that, that he's work working on this email function, for example, and then you can you can roughly know that because this guy is working, we're working with them, and you can ask them to, to communicate with each other. So you kind of facilitate them in a way. Yeah. So in cases like this, how do you actually stop a rock star engineer from being too clever and actually creating problems in future for your company? For example, like you delegate things to the rock star engineer, yeah. you have an element of trust to them. Yeah. And then the guy says that oh, I'm going to implement this feature using this new programming language that I read about, using right. this new database that I read about, using right. this new uh, server that I read about. Right. So he goes ahead and then he does all that kind of thing. And then as a project manager, you don't know these technical details. Yep. You're just like, oh, the feature is delivered. But the problem is, because the feature is delivered in that new language, new database structure, new everything, yeah. and then in the future when you have your non-Rockstar engineers or you want to hire more people to expand the feature, yeah. and then you realize that it was a bad business decision because it was implemented in such a niche technology yeah. that you know you just can't support it. Yeah. So in cases like this, how do you actually control your, or, or it's like, are there any warning signs to see when the Rockstar engineer is rocking too much? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Um, yeah, sometimes they, they because they think that they're the rock star, they just want to be to using to be using all the cutting edge technologies or all the new platform and so on. But but that's where the, the advanced planning come into play, and and also knowing also knowing who you're working with, because you may know that oh okay, this guy always like uh, <coughs> to 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 do fancy stuff uh, by himself. So we can try to, to get some kind of uh, engagement strategy by, 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 for example, again, linking the, the, ensuring that maybe you can, can agree with him, some, maybe you buy him coffee or whatever to ensure that he, uh, and say and I say to him that, oh, maybe when you do this thing, you know that actually some of your, your, your teammates also need to work on this and, and, and how, also pose him as a problem in a way, like how do you ensure that beyond just you working on this guy, but my challenge to you is that how do you ensure that your peers can also work on this? So maybe he'll come up with things like, maybe he still decide to use the, the, the new database stuff or the new technology, but at least maybe you can you can ask him to to do some maybe sharing sessions or, or like or like um, constantly sharing or, or like what we did at Ninja Fan, for example, for example, we we just use like a, what Rx Java or something. So um, it's a new. Java and, 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 and not all guys know how to use it. So what we did is that when we first decide to use this, uh, uh, we have some bunch of the rockstar engineers ask them like, oh, there's this special project for you that you have to research and, and, and find out what is this RX Java thingy or, and, and, and how, how do you explain it easily to your other team members in a way. So yeah, there's a sharing session and, and then we appoint them to be like the RX Java guru in a way. So like whenever there is uh, a problem, or whenever, whenever this, the C or the the, the the exclamation marks need need help, you sh you should know that. Or you always go to that guy, and and he is expected to you know teach you or, or or at least maybe pair program with you and so on. And that's that. And also, yeah. And that's that's how you you can you can, uh, you can deal with that. So I guess it works if all your rockstar engineers are actually nice guys. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, have you it's ever... In a dream world. Yeah, it's like, have you yeah. ever, like, had to make the decision on when you had to terminate a rockstar engineer? Yeah. Because, you know, rockstar engineer is like, they're very good, but maybe because they are there, they yeah. cause, like, unnecessary friction because of their behavior yeah. or because of the technical environment that they influence. Yeah. Even though you have, like, one rock star engineer, when is, it you're, when is it you make the decision that I'm going to fire this rock star engineer so that my other engineers actually have room to grow? Yeah. Again, uh, yeah, knowing the who, but again, I think this is uh, uh, more of a cultural fit also in a way that and we did have some some kind of that issue actually. 
So <coughs> one guy who is super smart, and when you give him a task, for example, you know what I did in the past one month? I quoted him from, from one of some other guys. He said that whatever I did in the past one month, no 10 Google engineers can do it. <laughs> and this kind of attitude. So in the end, we, we actually try to, we still have to um, coach him in a way that uh, still delegate tasks, but then you slowly talk to him that, oh, you know, uh, you know, some people are actually a bit uh, not comfortable with what you're doing. So can you adjust your your uh, uh, style and so on? And and yeah, but but at some point of time, you realize that maybe <coughs> it's not, it doesn't work with, with, more, with all people, and you have to actually uh, let go. But uh, yeah, you still have to give him a chance, and, and you still have to again use the full measure them to 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 at least identify. Maybe you try to understand why he is behaving that way. Maybe it's because of ego issue, or maybe he he, he just don't know that when he thinks what he's saying is, is something that is accepted in his culture, or maybe is 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 uh, so busy coming up with with how or 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 why he is 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 uh, is coming from, and then, and then you can can. Decide whether you want to use which. Uh, sure, sorry, well, yeah. time. Um, mm -hmm. You can look for him afterwards. Uh, so uh, let's all give a talk. Uh, let's all give a hand for Anthony and his talk.